Hello, everybody. I'm Storm Mushry, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And today we're going to have one of our habitat biologists. It's going to be Jennifer DeAnnabelle. She is out of Las Cruces and she is our south Southwest habitat biologist. She's going to be giving us a presentation today on managing habitat for wildlife. And with that, I'm going to let Jennifer take it away. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Storm said, I'm Jennifer DeAnnabelle, and I've been a wildlife and habitat biologist for about 10 years now. I graduated from San Diego State University and have traveled basically across the globe working with various wildlife um, in a variety of habitats. And I've been with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish for a little over a year working out of the Las Cruces. So your first question might be, what is habitat? And what does it mean when someone says that they are managing the habitat for wildlife? Well, most simply, it means that they are managing the area where wildlife live. Habitat is more than just the vegetation of the area. It is what a person would call home. More specifically, it is a, it is a complex mixture of plant communities, water, weather, animals, and other environmental that provide all the necessary resources that wildlife need to survive. Furthermore, while habitat refers to the home of, wild, of wildlife, ecologists will break that down further into habitat types. These are also called ecotypes. Ecotypes are habitats with similar characteristics, such as soil type, similar plant communities, and a similar historical disturbance pattern, such as fire, drought, or grazing. Some ecotype examples in New Mexico are wetlands, pinyon pine, juniper savannas, grasslands, and ponderosa pine dominated forest. By categorizing ecotypes, ecologists can decide which management practices to use. An example of this is when considering how to manage ponderosa pine dominated forest. These forests refer to forested areas and historical studies of these forests tell managers that this area would have had historic fire. So therefore, one management practice we might use would be a controlled burn. There are five basic needs for wildlife in any habitat type. The first one is food. Animals require proper nutrition to remain healthy, grow, reproduce, raise offspring, resist diseases, and escape predators. Depending on the time of year, the amount of rainfall, and the wildlife species, food can refer to flowers, grasses, shrubs, cacti, nectar, insects, and other wildlife. The second is water. Water is required by wildlife for proper digest digestion and maintaining body temperature. In the desert, water can be sourced from food, especially cacti and agave. Freestanding water, such as springs and creeks, are also important to wildlife and the wildlife water needs vary depending on the time of year and if the young are being raised. The third is cover. Cover gives wildlife the ability to hide and have protection needed for survival. Cover is needed to remain hidden from predators, especially the young that cannot run or fly away like adults. However, cover is also important protection against the elements such as extreme heat or snowstorms. Fourth is space. Space is necessary to avoid overcompetition for food. Some animals need a certain amount of territorial space for mating. For example, mountain lions can have a home range of five to over 100 square miles, depending on the availability of food, water, and cover. And these territories will not typically overlap with individuals of the same sex in order to reduce mating competition and competition for the above resources. And lastly is suitable arrangement of the first four needs. This is the placement of food, water, cover, and space in, a, in the habitat that allows for wildlife to meet all of their needs while keeping energy use minimal. By having a, a suitable arrangement, this allows for wildlife to focus their energy on raising young and escaping predators instead of foraging for healthy food or searching for water. So why does the habitat need to be managed? Well, there are many factors that result in the habitat needing to be managed. Some of these are urbanization and human development, 
due to a consistently growing human population, habitat fragmentation, which means cutting up wildlife habitat into smaller fragments or smaller pieces. And this results from various logging practices and also the expanding human development. There's also been decades of fire suppression, which has resulted in overcrowded and unhealthy forests. Pollution from excessive trash and pollution from greenhouse gases going into the air has also contributed to multiple issues. And the inter introduction of domestic animals. Domestic animals compete for habitat as well as being vectors of disease to wildlife. So what exactly does managing the habitat mean? Well, as defined in a paper by Yarrow and Yarrow, it is the, the deliberate act of manipulating wildlife habitat for the benefit of wildlife and people. More simply, it just means the intentional practice of changing the environment to ensure that wildlife has a healthy home. Understanding what wildlife need to live in a given environment and the historic disturbance patterns of that environment are all necessary in order to make well-informed habitat management decisions. Restoration is a type of habitat management, but habitat management itself typically be goes beyond most restoration practices. It will often be on the landscape scale, such as creating corridors to fight fragmentation, planting or protecting vegetation for food and cover, making water available and allowing the environment to resume natural processes that have been suppressed over decades, such as fire. And habitat manage management is becoming one of the most critical aspects of wildlife conservation due to the issues that I labeled before. Now I wanna go over just a few examples of projects that I've been involved in since I've been with the department. So this is a prescribed fire and a prescribed fire is a controlled burn that is usually done when conditions will allow for the fire to carry, but not carry too much. A controlled burn is conducted outside of the hottest season to make sure that the fire cannot burn too hot, hot or get out of control. There are always firefighters on standby, ready to put out the fire if it burns too hot or too fast. Prescribed fire will also allow for controlled moderate level flat fire to clear away excess dead grass and slow down shrub encroachment. A fire that burns with low or moderate intensity is often good for the environment where, where good for the environment in areas where fire has been part of the disturbance pattern. However, a fire that burns too hot will often kill the plants and the seeds and the habitat will have a hard time recovering. Therefore, without controlled burns, it is more likely that a wildfire would burn too hot and scorch the earth. And these photos here are an example from a department burn out in Millisand or near Millisand, New Mexico for prairie chicken habitat. Uh, it's in the Southeast portion of the state and historically this grassland would have burned but it's been suppressed for a few decades. So by reintroducing habitat, fire to this habitat, we've allowed the grasses to get rid of excess dead leaves, reduce woody shrub encroachment and clear out some ground space for flowers and other grasses to come back. And this all allows for more food and cover for the prairie chicken. Another example is forest thinning. Due to decades of fire suppression, many of our forests have become overgrown with trees. This limits amount, the amount of light that can reach the forest floor and stops the growth of flowers, grass, and shrubs that are needed for wildlife to eat. If a forest is too dense, it also creates unhealthy trees that aren't getting enough space and sunlight. And it can also lead to wildfires that will burn too hot and kill the whole forest. Therefore, we often thin forest and then follow the thin with a prescribed fire. The thinning allows for the forest to have more sunlight to hit the ground, which will allow for food and cover for wildlife, as well as open up some pace spaces so that the wildlife can watch for predators approaching. Thinning also allows for prescribed fire to be reintroduced to the landscape by reducing the fuel load. And these three photos are from various thinning projects that I have gone out to look at that the department has funded out in the Gila National Forest and they should all be followed with a prescribed burn 
in the next year or two. Another example <clears throat> is protecting wetlands and riparian areas. Now, these areas are very important because they are some of the most vulnerable habitats around, greatly affected by overuse and pollution. In order to protect these areas, the department has installed fences that restrict cattle from entering, but allow the wildlife to come and go freely. This allows the vegetation to grow plentiful for wildlife to meet their basic needs of food and cover. And the vegetation also stops erosion along the stream banks to help keep the river rivers healthy and provide clean water for the wildlife. And these two photos are taken from inside an enclosure surrounding the Three Rivers area out in the Southeast region of the state. And the department helped fund the building of the enclosures around these. Besides implementing projects to manage the habitat, what habitat biologists also have to manage large amounts of money for projects, apply for grants, write project proposals, stay up to date with the newest science regarding ecology, and work with a variety of different people to achieve a goal. There's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into completing a habitat project for wildlife. And that was just a brief overview of what it means to manage habitat for wildlife, along with a couple projects that I've been involved in. Managing habitat is a bit like being an ecosystem engineer. It is not the same as actual ecosystem engineers as beavers. We humans still have a lot to learn. But if you have any questions, please feel free to email me anytime. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I loved your presentation. It was uh, very... Um to the point. And I think anybody that watches this module is going to get a lot of valuable information out of it. And I think it's one of those that a lot of people, when they think of a biologist, uh, they think of a fisheries biologist or a wildlife biologist. And a lot of the times right. they, they don't know that we've got biologists that strictly uh, work you know, like habitat biologists, but they're, they're mm -hmm. still managing the land for wildlife and fisheries uh, right. you know, work. But uh, it's one of those that before we let you go today, um, Jennifer, if, if there was some advice that you could give somebody that is interested in getting into, you know, wildlife and fisheries as a profession, um, what, what kind of information do you think would be very valuable to them? I think, really understanding which direction you want to go towards and looking for the proper coursework. So a lot of, especially federal jobs that hire biologists require very specific courses. So whether they be range or botany, um, soil classes, like making sure that you are checking those off so that when you do apply for jobs, you have that experience. Because all is, also looking for volunteer jobs, volunteer opportunities anywhere to help get you some experience and make some connections. Okay, very good. And uh, I know you all are, are very busy, um, you know, going out in the field and, and I know, you know, grant season is around the corner with the new fiscal. And uh, so I know you all probably have a lot of lot of office stuff happening right now as well. But just want to thank you for your time today. And with that, I hope you all enjoy this recording and we'll uh, catch you at the next one. So thank you.